Chapter Seventeen The Good Little Mouse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. The Old, Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine. The Good Little Mouse. Once upon a time there lived a king and a queen whose mutual affection was so extreme that they formed each other's sole joy. Their sentiments and wishes were always in perfect unison. Sometimes they went hunting the hare or the stag, sometimes fishing for sole or carp, but always together. At balls they were always partners, at feasts they ate of the same dish roast lamb with sugar plums they frequently went to the theatre or the opera together they sang duets and played a score of merry tricks for their mutual diversion at home in a word they were the happiest king and queen and theirs was the happiest court on record the subjects followed their sovereign's example and vied with each other in light-heartedness and good humour for all these reasons the kingdom was called happy land at the same time there happened to be a neighboring state a king of quite an opposite character he was the declared enemy of pleasure and thought the more grief the better sport his looks were sullen his eyes were hollow his beard was long and grisly his body was thin his complexion sallow and his hair black thick and as rough as a bear's this ferocious monarch would amuse himself by shooting at his subjects he was himself the executioner of criminals and delighted only in cruel and wicked deeds when he heard of a kind mother who was very fond of a good little boy or girl he summoned them to his presence and either strangled the child or broke its arm before its mother's face his kingdom was called tearland this wicked king having heard of the happiness of the good king felix became so jealous of his neighbor's joy that he resolved to raise a large army and lay waste to his dominions when everything was ready the bad king constantine advanced towards happy land the news of his coming was not long in reaching the ears of king felix he therefore promptly put his kingdom in a state of defence queen felicia was in an agony of fear and said to her husband with tears in her eyes sir let us take as much money as we can carry and fly to any place on earth from the threatened danger for shame madame answered felix my duty is to protect my people and it bids me prefer a glorious death to a life of shame he then tenderly kissed his queen and having assembled and inspected his army mounted a noble charger and set out to meet the enemy felicia left alone gave way to the most heart trending tears and lamentations and wringing her hands alas alas said she what will become of me should felix be slain in battle a widow and a captive the wicked king will never spare me in his wrath these sorrowful thoughts prevented her eating and sleeping the king wrote to her daily from the camp and one morning as she was anxiously watching the arrival of the courier from the city walls she saw him approaching the city at full gallop she hastened to meet him fearful of some great misfortune crying out ho courier ho courier what news do you bring the battle is lost said the messenger the king is killed and the wicked constantine is on the road hither the poor queen fainted away and was carried to bed insensible where all her ladies and tears surrounded her some mourning for the loss of a father 
others for sons or brothers. There was weeping and wailing and tearing of hair. Soon the bad king was heard approaching. Heading his unprincipled subjects, he entered the city, sword in hand, and slew without mercy all whom he encountered. The inhabitants fled before him with loud cries, and all who escaped took refuge in the country. With his sword still reeking, the king entered the palace and ascended to the queen's apartment. When she beheld him in the room, she buried herself under the bedclothes, terrified to the last degree. He strode up to the bed, pulled off the clothes, tore the queen's cap from her head, and scattered her long ringlets over her shoulders. Then, gathering them in his hand, he dragged her three times round the room, and threw her over his shoulders as if she had been a sack of corn, and in this manner carried her off. Felicia entreated him for mercy, but in vain he only laughed at her supplications. The king carried Felicia to his own country, swearing all the way that he was determined to hang her, but, on second thought, he determined to spare her life for the present, and if she had a daughter, to marry the latter to his son. Anxious to know if she would have a daughter, he sent for a fairy, who lived at no great distance from his palace. When she arrived, he entertained the fairy better than was his usual custom, and conducted her to the tower in the upper part of which, in a small and miserably furnished garret, the poor queen was confined. There was no bed, but a wretched worn-out old mattress only, not worth two pence, on which the desolate Felicia sat and wept day and night. When the fairy saw her, her heart melted with pity. She courtesied to the queen and whispered in her ear as she embraced her, Do not despair, madame. Your misfortunes will not last for ever, and I hope to contribute to their speedy termination. Queen Felicia, somewhat comforted by these words, returned the fairy's embrace and begged her to take pity on a poor princess who had never designedly injured any one, but had always endeavored to do all the good in her power. They were conversing together when the wicked king interrupted them with, Come, not so many compliments. I brought you hither to tell me whether this slave will have a son or a daughter. The fairy answered, she will have a daughter who will be the fairest and most charming princess ever seen. With that the fairy endowed the princess yet to be born with innumerable virtues and accomplishments. If she prove not fair and amiable, said the wicked king, I will tie her to her mother's neck and hang them to the branch of a tree, nor shall tears nor entreaties induce me to relent. He then quitted the garret, accompanied by the fairy, without bestowing a look upon the good queen, who was weeping bitterly and saying to herself, Alas, what will become of me? Should I have a pretty little daughter, he will give her to his monster son. Should she be ugly, he will hang us both. To what a miserable extremity am I reduced? She had no friend to whom she could confide her trouble, or who might console her. Her jailer gave her daily three parched peas only, with a small allowance of water, and sometimes a very small piece of black bread. She soon therefore became thinner than a herring, and reduced to mere skin and bone. As she was spinning one evening, for the wicked king, who was very covetous made her work day and night she saw a very pretty little mouse creep through a hole into her room alas my darling said the wretched felicia there is nothing here for you three peas a day are my allowance if so if you would not fast go elsewhere for food the little mouse ran to and fro 
dancing and skipping so gaily that the queen took much pleasure in watching its antics and was induced to give it the only pea she had left for her supper here pretty one she said eat this it is all i have to offer you but i give it willingly the words had scarcely passed her lips when she saw on her table a fine plump partridge admirably dressed with bread sauce and two boxes of bonbons in truth said felicia a kind action always brings its reward with that she ate a little but having fasted so long she was almost past eating she threw a sweetmeat to the mouse who soon began to nibble it and when he had done his supper danced still more prettily than before the next morning when the jailer brought the queen's three peas which he carried in on a large dish with a cover by way of ridicule the little mouse crept softly to the dish and munched them all three together with the morsel of bread when it was dinner time and the queen found the dish empty she was somewhat angry with the mouse this greedy little creature said the hungry felicia if it serve me so to-morrow i shall pine to death she was about to put the cover over the empty dish when she found all kinds of nice things in it and rejoicing at this unexpected discovery quickly began to eat but while she was eating it came to her mind that the wicked king would perhaps in a few days put her and her child to death and she ceased eating to indulge her tears then raising her eyes to heaven she exclaimed what and is there no means of escape as she spoke she observed her little friend playing with two or three long straws felicia took them from the mouse and began to plait them if i had enough said she i would make a covered basket large enough to hold my little daughter and give her through the window to the first charitable person who would take charge of her she set to work with a good heart while the good little mouse took care that she did not want for straw continuing to drag it into the garret as fast as felicia could use it and dancing and skipping for her amusement at meal times the queen gave her three peas to the mouse and received in exchange a good supply of delicious food felicia was extremely puzzled to imagine who it could be that sent her so many nice things as she was one day looking out of the window to try the length of her straw plate she observed at the foot of the tower a good little woman leaning on a staff who directly she saw the queen's face said to her i am acquainted with your grief madame and i am willing to assist you alas my dear friend answered the queen you will do me a great favor come every evening under my window and when my child is born i will lower the dear baby to you nurse it and bring it up for me and when i am able i will amply reward you i am not covetous answered the old woman but am somewhat dainty and there is nothing pleases my palate better than a nice fat plump mouse if you can catch any such in your garret kill them and throw them to me i am not ungrateful and your infant will fare all the better for your kindness when queen felicia heard this speech she began to cry and the old woman after waiting her answer for a few minutes asked her the cause of her tears i grieve said the poor queen because there is only one mouse which comes to my chamber and it is so pretty and so good that i cannot put it to death what answered the old woman in a passion could you sacrifice your child for love for a little rogue of a mouse 
who nibbles all that falls in his way? Very well, madame, please yourself, and I wish you very much joy with your companion. I shall not want for mice without your assistance. With that the old woman went her way, grumbling and muttering between her teeth. Although the queen had a nice meal on her table, and although the good little mouse came as usual to skip and dance for her amusement, she kept her eyes riveted on the floor, her heart beating violently, while tears coursed each other down her cheeks. That very night she became the mother of a little girl, a miracle of beauty, which instead of crying like other children, smiled in her face, holding out her tiny hands as if she had been very rational. The queen caressed and kissed the little stranger very tenderly, saying to herself, Alas, my poor little darling, if you fall into the wicked king's clutches, it will be all up with you. She then placed her gently in the basket and pinned to her clothes a scrap of paper on which was written, This unfortunate little girl's name is Ameta. In a minute, or two she opened the basket again and though her infant looked prettier than ever she kissed her again and burst into tears at this moment the good little mouse skipped into the room and crept into the basket with ameta ah little creature said felicia how dearly i have purchased your life perhaps i shall lose my dear ameta who but i would have grumpled to kill you for the dainty old woman's dinner. Well, I could not find it in my heart to do so cruel a deed. The good little mouse answered the queen in these words. Do not regret your kindness, madame. I am not quite so unworthy of it as you may imagine. Fear and astonishment struggled in the queen's breast when she heard the little mouse speak and her fear not a little increased when she observed its little snout take the form of a face, with its little paws become hands and feet, and all at once its whole body increase in size. At last the queen recognized in the now entirely metamorphed mouse the fairy who had visited her in company with the wicked king and who had manifested so much affection for her. The fairy spoke, I have tried your heart, and I find that it is good and generous. We fairies, although possessed of wealth and power, seek, as the greatest treasure upon earth, true friendship, and rarely do we find it. Is it possible, fair lady, said the queen, embracing her, that you rich and powerful as you are have any difficulty to find friends yes answered the fairy we are loved but for interest and that is not the kind of love we care for but when loved as you loved me as a little mouse no service is too great to show our affection anxious to put your goodness to the test I assumed the figure of an old woman and accosted you from the foot of the tower. You know that your heart was proof against the trial. Thereupon the fairy embraced the queen, and having tenderly kissed the little princess three times, she said, I endow you, sweet child, to be the comfort of your mother and richer than your father, to reach the age of one hundred years with undiminished beauty, free from illness, wrinkles, or other appearance of age. The queen in raptures thanked the beneficent fairy, and entreated her to remove Ameta from the prison, and take care of her, adding that she give her child freely to be the fairy's daughter. The fairy accepted the present, and thanked Queen Felicia, she placed the baby gently in the basket and lowered it through the window but having waited a few moments to resume the shape of the little mouse when she descended by the straw plate 
the baby was no longer there she returned hastily to the queen all is lost she said my enemy Cosseline has just carried off the princess you must know she is a cruel fairy who mortally hates me and being unfortunately my senior is more powerful than myself i know not how i can contrive to withdraw a meta from her vile clutches when the queen heard this sad intelligence her grief was excessive weeping very bitterly she conjured her kind friend to endeavor to recover her darling Ameta at all hazards meanwhile the jailer coming to pay his daily visit to the queen knew that she had become a mother and hastened to inform the wicked king who went straight away to demand the child felicia said that a fairy whose name she did not know had taken it from her by force on hearing this the wicked king stamped his feet and gnawed his very finger-nails with rage i promised said he to hang you nor will i delay to keep my word with that he seized the poor queen by the hair of her head dragged her into a wood climbed a tall tree and was on the point of hanging her when the fairy having rendered herself invisible came close beside him and pushed him down to the ground dislocating his nose and breaking for teeth in the fall the fairy then hastened away with the queen in her flying chariot and conducted her to a noble castle where felicia was carefully nursed and and for the loss of her little ameta would have been completely happy time slipped away and the queen's excessive affliction gradually diminished fifteen years had passed since the birth of her daughter when she heard that the wicked king's son had offered his hand to a young girl who kept his father's turkeys but that she had refused him it was not a little surprising that a turkey keeper should refuse to become a princess with a reasonable prospect of being one day queen the nuptial dresses too were prepared and it was to have been so gay a wedding that guests had come to witness it from three hundred miles round the good little mouse was among these guests and wishing to see the turkey keeper at her ease paid her a visit in the poultry yard she found the turkey keeper seated on a large stone dressed in a coarse stuff petticoat with neither shoe nor socking on her feet dresses of gold and silver brocade trimmed with diamonds pearls ribbons and the finest lace were lying near her trodden under the turkey's feet covered with dirt and completely spoiled presently the wicked king's son who was lame humpbacked and blind of one eye approached her and said rudely if you still refuse to have me i will be the death of you the turkey keeper answered hotly i can never love nor consent to marry you you are too ugly and too much like your cruel father leave me in peace with my turkeys i love them better than all your finery the good little mouse gazed on her with admiration for she was as beautiful as the moon when the wicked king's son was out of sight the fairy assumed the figure of an old shepherdess and accosting the rustic beauty said good morrow daughter you have a fine flock of fat turkeys here the young turkey keeper smiled sweetly on the old dame and said they are trying to persuade me to abandon them for a weary crown pray assist me with your advice daughter said the fairy a crown is not to be despised you neither know its value nor importance so well do i know both the one and the other answered the turkey keeper promptly that i am resolved never to share one with an unworthy person yet i do not know who i am nor who are my father and mother 
I have neither relations nor friends. You have beauty and virtue, my child, said the wise fairy, which are more valuable than ten kingdoms. Tell me, I entreat you, who placed you here, since you have neither father, mother, relations, or friends? A fairy, answered the fair turkey feeder, named Cochaline, is the cause of me being in this place. She brought me up from infancy, but treated me so cruelly that one day I resolved to escape from her house, and, after wandering for some time, was resting in a wood, when the wicked king's son happened to pass that way. He saw me and asked if I would take care of his poultry. I accepted his offer, and his turkeys were immediately placed under my charge. He came from time to time to see how they thrived, and of course saw me also, when alas, without the slightest desire on my part for the honor, he fell so desperately in love that I am teased out of my life by his importunities. When the fairy had heard this artless tale, she began to think that the turkey keeper must be the Princess Ameta. What is your name, my dear? she said. I am called Ameta, answered the rustic. On hearing this, the fairy could no longer doubt the truth of her surmises. So throwing her arm round the princess's neck, she almost devoured her with caresses, and said, Ameta, I have known you from your birth, and am very glad to find you so pretty and so prudent, but I shall like to see you better dressed, as your present appearances is anything but favorable, let me see how you look in these fine clothes. Ameta, who was very obedient, immediately complied with the fairy's request. She uncovered her head, when immediately her long hair, which was finer than gossamer, and of the most delicate auburn, fell to the ground in graceful curls then taking in the palms of her delicate hands some water from a clear stream that ran near the henhouse she bathed her face when her complexion became clear as oriental pearl roses seemed to blow upon her cheeks and carnations on her lips her mild breath was as sweet as the honeysuckle or wild thyme her form was graceful as the fawns while the whiteness of her bosom surpassed that of drifted snow or lily of the valley when she was dressed the fairy declared her a miracle of beauty and said who now do you think you are my dear ameta in truth answered the princess i cannot help fancying myself the daughter of some great king should you be very glad if it were so asked the fairy yes my dear madame answered ameta courtesying i should be very very glad very well said the fairy be happy then i will tell you more to-morrow thereupon the fairy departed and returned in all diligence to her fine castle where queen felicia was employed spinning silk will it please you your majesty cried the good little mouse to wager your spindle and your distaff that i do not bring you the best news you have ever heard alas answered the queen since the death of king felix and the loss of my darling ameta all the news in the world is nothing to me a truce to your sorrow said the fairy the princess whom i have just seen is quite well and so exceedingly beautiful that it will be her own fault if she do not become a queen the good fairy then related all she had learned and the queen shed tears of joy to hear that her daughter was still alive and so beautiful but was overwhelmed with the sorrow to learn that she was a turkey keeper when my dear husband and myself were a powerful king and queen 
and in the height of our prosperity we little thought a child of ours would ever be a turkey keeper never mind said the fairy it is a trick of the wicked Cosseline, who aware of my affection for you has reduced ameta to this condition but i will be equal with my rival yet and will either restore the princess to her proper rank or burn my books i have no ambition to see my child married to the wicked king's son said the queen so do not delay to bring her hither in the meantime the wicked king's son repulsed by ameta in the presence of the good little mouse was very much enraged against her and seating himself under the palace wall he began to cry so loudly that the wicked king overheard him throwing up the window and putting out his head what is the matter what are you making all this noise about said he or turkey keeper loves me not answered the son how loves you not said the wicked king but i say she shall love you with that he called his guards and gave orders for them to bring the turkey keeper to his presence adding that he would make her bitterly repent her obstinacy in refusing to love his handsome son the guards in obedience to the orders they had received went immediately to the turkey yard when they found Ameta attired in a superb robe of white satin, embroidered with diamonds and rubies, and tastefully trimmed with ribbon, never in their lives had they seen so noble-looking and beautiful a lady, and believing her to be a princess, they were afraid to speak. "'Pray tell me whom you seek,' said Ameta, in a very sweet and amiable voice. "'Madame!' they answered we come by the king's orders in search of a wretched young woman named ameta alas answered the princess that is my name what would you with me they dared not hesitate to seize her so binding her hands and feet with strong cords they dragged her before the wicked king and his son when the king saw how very beautiful she was in spite of himself he was a little moved indeed she must have excited the kindest feelings in his bosom if he had not been the most wicked person in the world when he had surveyed her from head to foot he said so madame i hear that you will not consent to marry my son he is a hundred times too good for you and fine as you think yourself one of his looks is worth more than all of your charms come marry him immediately or i will have you flayed alive the princess trembling like a dove in the net of the fowler threw herself at his feet and embracing his knees said sire i conjure you to have pity on me to endure an unprotected girl would be unworthy of your royal dignity give me a day or two to reflect and i will then no longer oppose your wishes the son furious at her for not consenting on the spot would have had her flayed at once but the king finally resolved to place her in confinement and she was conducted to a high tower where she was deprived of the light of the sun at this crisis the good fairy and the queen arrived in the flying chariot and soon learned all that had taken place the queen began to weep bitterly saying that her misfortunes were interminable but that she would rather see her daughter dead than married to the wicked king's son be of good cheer said the fairy i am about to annoy them that you shall be amply avenged when the wicked king went to bed the beneficent fairy having assumed the shape of a mouse concealed herself under the bolster of his bed and just as he was falling asleep 
crept out and gnawed his ear. Muttering an oath, he turned around in bed when the little mouse gnawed his other ear. The king flew into a passion and called aloud for help. The attendants entered the room and found the king with both his ears so severely bitten and bleeding so fast that all their efforts to staunch the wounds were unavailing. While a diligent search was making for the mouse, she paid the wicked king's son a visit, served him in the same manner. He was soon heard bawling for assistance, and when the servants came into his apartment, they beheld him with his ears nearly skinned. The surgeon was sent for, and the good little mouse returned to the wicked king's bedchamber, when she found the king again dozing off to sleep. She now crept up to his nose and began to nibble with all her might, and when the king covered that with his hands, she applied herself industriously to bite and scratch them also. Help, help, cried the king. I am suffering martyrdom. And while he was shouting, the little mouse crept into his mouth and nibbled his tongue lips and cheeks the attendants rushed into the room and found the king looking ghastly and almost speechless from the effects of the mouse's little teeth on his tongue all he could do was to make signs that a mouse was the author of this new mischief when the mattress the bolster and every hole and corner of the room were again searched in vain for the mouse was off a second time to the sun, whom she completely blinded, for she gnawed his remaining eye, he was already blind of one. In a transport of fury, with his drawn sword in hand, he blundered into his father's room, whom he found storming and swearing that he would destroy everything an inch high and an hour old if the mouse were not found. When the king saw his son, he stormed also at him, and the latter, whose ears were bound up, not recognizing his father's voice, immediately attacked him. The wicked king, amazed, thrust his sword through the body of his son, and stumbled in his eagerness on his adversary's weapon, which impaled him, and thus father and son rolled on the floor dead at each other's hands. Their subjects, who hated them morally, and only obeyed them out of fear, no longer dreading their anger, tied cords to their feet and dragged them into the river, saying that they were very glad to be rid of them so easily. Thus died the wicked king of Tearland, and his equally wicked son. The beneficent fairy hastened to inform the queen of the event, and they went together to the black tower in which Ameta was confined under more than forty locks. The fairy struck the outer door three times with her little nut-tree wand, when it immediately flew open, as did all the others, and they found the poor princess in the deepest affliction throwing herself on her daughter's neck. My long-lost darling, said the queen, I am your unfortunate mother, Queen Felicia. Thereupon she communicated to the princess every particular of her history, at which Ameta was so transported with joy that it almost cost her her life. She threw herself at the queen's feet, embraced them, bathed them with her tears, and kissed them again and again. She then tenderly embraced the fairy, who had brought her basketfuls full of jewels of enormous value, with gold, diamonds, bracelets, pearls, and the portrait of King Felix, set in jewels, which she held up for her inspection. But we have no time to lose, said she. Now is the time for a master stroke. Let us go to the large hall of the palace and harangue the people. The fairy led the way with a very sedate and serious countenance. 
wearing a robe with a train more than six ells long the queen's dress was of blue velvet covered with gold embroidery and had still a longer train in order to make this display they had brought their richest suits with them they wore likewise crowns on their heads which sparkled like so many suns the princess ameta followed her mother looking as modest as diana and as beautiful as venus they curtsied to all whom they met gentle or simple a crowd soon collected about them anxious to learn who these fair and noble-looking ladies could be they entered the large hall in which the court was usually held and when it was as full as it could hold the beneficent fairy told the people that she proposed to give them for their queen the daughter of king felix of happy land whom she then introduced to their notice adding that they would certainly be contented with her government and that if they accepted her for their sovereign she the fairy would find ameta a husband as perfect as herself and would restore cheerfulness to the kingdom and forever banish melancholy from their hearts when these words were heard loud shouts of long live ameta queen of tearland now happy land resounded from the multitude and almost split the roof at the same moment a hundred different musical instruments struck up a lively waltz and the people joined hands and began to dance round the queen her daughter and the begonant fairy singing with one voice all hail to our queen who brings brightness and joy to the hearts of a people by care long oppressed long long may she live while each thought we employ to render her happy by whom we are blessed a wiser or better earth never has seen then live ameta long long live the queen thus kindly they were welcomed and never until the time in which we live was there a queen more beloved at her coronation which as may be expected was magnificent in the extreme tables were spread in the park collations were served all present ate drank and were merry and then retired to rest blessing their youthful queen shortly afterward the fairy presented to the gentle ameta the most handsome prince that eyes ever looked upon and what is more as good as he was handsome the fairy who had to seek such a paragon of a husband in a very remote kingdom brought him in her flying chariot and so well were they matched that directly they met they conceived the most tender and lasting attachment for each other magnificent preparations were made for the wedding and the ceremony was performed with the utmost splendor and followed by rejoicings which lasted six months throughout the kingdom end of chapter seventeen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 18 Septimus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Stanley. The Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine. Septimus. There was once upon a time a king and queen who had a very small kingdom to govern. The king was named Petard. He was a very good man rather blunt of a weak and limited mind but otherwise the best king in the world his subjects were nearly as much masters of his kingdom as himself for on the most unimportant occasions they gave their advice rather loudly and without its being asked for and each of them wished his notions on government to be noticed and followed the queen was called giletta she had no larger share of talents than her husband but still her character was mild 
timid and inoffensive which caused her to speak little and often by sentences only she paid that submissive deference to the king which a wife usually pays to the husband to whom she owes her fortune as petard was the only child of the king and queen his father and mother resolved from his birth to marry him to a little princess the niece of an old fairy named gangan who was at that time the intimate friend of petard's father and mother it is true that the princess was not yet come into the world but on gangan's assuring them that she should one day be an accomplished person all that she required was promised and an oath was even taken to ensure it petard having arrived at twenty-five years of age thought it would be proper to marry to his own mind he troubled himself but little about his father and mother's promises and married without their consent an extremely pretty young lady of whom he was very fond she was only a rich farmer's daughter but although she was married to a king's son her natural good sense prevented her from becoming vain that is to say silly the king petard's father angry at that prince's marriage could not refuse to gangang the right of avenging the affront which he had put on them both he accordingly disinherited his son forbade him ever to appear at his court and gave him his portion which it was settled should be a pretty considerable estate on which his father-in-law was farmer all the favour that was granted him was leave to erect this little estate into a sovereignty himself having the title of king and majesty shortly after his disgrace his father died and his mother having obtained the regency was not sorry to be unencumbered with a son who notwithstanding his want of wit might have been able to thwart her projects and to oppose her desire of reigning petard was neither ambitious nor a conqueror consequently he was not long in accustoming himself to his small estate and even becoming very well pleased with it small as it was he reigned therein as though it were larger in fact it was quite as large as was necessary for him and the titles of king and majesty served him instead of a large kingdom but as the most bounded minds have always at least their share of vanity he soon prided himself in imitating the king his father and created a seneschal a solicitor general and a chamberlain for in those days chancellors and parliaments were unlike unknown the kings administered justice themselves and received in person their revenues he also coined money instituted with his seneschal regulations for the police of his little kingdom his father-in-law carbuncle being the person whom he honoured with the title of seneschal he was a frank sincere and upright man and was endowed by nature with good common sense and some imagination accordingly he decided slowly but nearly always justly he knew by heart the verses of the poets of his time and was fond of reciting them this little appointment did not make him vain for he continued to make the farm as valuable as before which so gained him his son-in-law's confidence that his majesty soon was unable to do without him carbuncle visited the king every morning and took his breakfast with him they talked on business but the minister would very often say to the king sire with your permission you do not understand it allow me to manage and all will go well let everybody mind his own affairs says the poet but replied the king what shall i do then whatever you like answered carbuncle you can govern your wife and your kitchen garden that is all that is required of you in truth i think you are right said the king so do as you think fit however to lose nothing on the score of reputation he always displayed himself on feast days in a royal cloak of red cloth printed with flowers of gold a cap of the same material with a gilded wooden sceptre which he had bought of an old strolling player who had retired from the stage in accordance with the advice of his seneschal he purchased almanacs which were forwarded to him every year in the month of july and which he had regularly bound in fine marble paper with the edges gilt in the one he learned the proper sowing time also the season for planting cutting grafting draining and clearing and he trusted in it so implicitly that he often physicked himself and his queen when they did not want it in the other he studied political prophecies with which he was so bewildered that he understood nothing about them at the end of a few years all these almanacs formed for him quite a little library of which he was as fond as though it had been equal to the Bodleian, and he and the seneschal alone had keys to it in the afternoon he employed himself in his royal little kitchen garden 
and in putting in practice what his almanac had taught him in the morning. In the evening he sent for Cobuncle, with whom he played until supper-time, at Beat My Neighbour Out of Doors, or Piquet. Then he supped in public with the Queen, and at ten o'clock everybody was in bed. Gilletta, on her part, employed herself with the household affairs. She spun with her women, and made with her cows and goat's milk excellent cheese, and delightful jam tarts for her husband's supper. But above all, every morning she never failed to knead a little cake of barley flour, which she baked on the hearth, and carried with a cream cheese to her little garden, where she placed it at the foot of a rose tree, as she had been directed in a dream to do the day after her wedding. The tranquillity which they both enjoyed in their little kingdom was only disturbed by the wish of having children. They had been married two years, and Petard had begun to despair, when one day, as he was in his fruit garden with his seneschal, the first lady of honour to the queen came and announced to him that he had become a father. Transported with joy at this intelligence, he embraced the lady with all his heart, and taking from his finger a fine ring formed of a cat's eye, he presented it to her. He did not stop there, for he gave that evening a grand supper to all the chief men of his kingdom, after which he tied off himself all his artillery, which consisted of twelve arquebuses with locks and six carbines with rods. It is said that, at supper, his immediate joy made him say things incompatible with his dignity, and that when his seneschal remonstrated with him upon the subject, he replied by throwing a large glass of wine in that minister's face, saying, Many thanks, father-in-law, you are perhaps right, but one is not a father every day. However, let us say no more about it, and let us rejoice, for in my place you would, perhaps, act quite as wisely. Carbuncle made no reply, and everybody withdrew from their majesties very well pleased. As the king was loved by his subjects, rejoicings were duly made the same day and hour all over the kingdom to celebrate this event. Everything comes in time to him who can wait, said the queen quietly, for instead of one child at one birth, she brought Petard seven, three boys, three girls, and then another boy. The last child had the most beautiful eyes that were ever seen, a white skin and eyebrows like his hair black as jet. As he was born with curly hair, the king and queen liked him better than the others, and the queen absolutely wished herself to nurse her little Septimus, which was his name. At the end of eighteen months, the three princes became so lively and playful that the nurses could not do anything with them. When they complained to the king, he answered them, Let them alone. When they shall be as old as I am, they will not be so lively. I was the same. I who am now speaking to you, all in good time. The three princesses, on the contrary, were gentle, but so dull, so quiet, that they would remain in any places they were put, which caused the king to like his sons best, and the queen to prefer her daughters, except in regard to Septimus, who had none of his brother's and sister's defects, and was the prettiest child in the world. He would soon have been spoiled if a kind fairy unknown to Gangan, and even to Gilletta, had not endowed him with an equable and unchangeable character. When it was necessary to wean the children of their majesties, a cabinet council was called, composed of the seneschal, the solicitor-general, the chamberlain, and the nurses who were also summoned. After a long discussion it was resolved, by the advice of Carbuncle, to use cow's milk for the three boys, and goat's milk for the three girls. This appeared to be a very good and simple means of correcting the vivacity of the princes, and the dullness of the princesses. But when they were older, and it became necessary to give them more substantial food, they consumed such an enormous quantity that the king's revenues were considerably diminished thereby. Besides, as the princes had lost only part of their vivacity by their early nourishment, and the princesses had acquired an additional quantity, there was an uproar and frightful quarrelling all day long. They fought and pulled each other about, and wore out so many, many clothes, that there could hardly be enough found for them. The little Septimus alone was mild and obedient, and his brothers and sisters were always playing him some roguish trick. The king would frequently say to the queen, your three daughters grow excessively tall, and by my sceptre I hardly know what I shall do with them. As for my boys, I will give them the care of my farm, but for your daughters it is different. To which the queen would answer, 
sire let us have patience for everything comes in time to him who can wait while king petard made himself uneasy and queen gilletta kept herself quiet their children attained seven years of age every one of those who composed their court had already given his advice or rather his decision as to the establishment of the princesses and princes when one morning the queen who had just kneaded her little cake perceived on the table a pretty little blue mouse nibbling the dough her first impulse was to drive it away but an involuntary feeling withheld her she watched it attentively and was much surprised to see it seize the little cake and carry it up the chimney her quietness now gave way to her impatience and running after the mouse with the intention of taking its booty from it she saw it both disappear and beheld in their place a little shrivelled old woman a foot high at most after making several grimaces and uttering some half intelligible words this little hop o' my thumb put the shovel and tongs across each other described over them with a broom three circles and three triangles uttered seven short sharp cries and finished by throwing the broom over her head the queen notwithstanding her fear did not fail to remark that the old woman while tracing the circles and triangles had distinctly pronounced these three words confidence discretion happiness and was trying to discover their meaning when a voice which she had heard in the next room attracted her attention as she thought it was septimus's voice she ran there immediately but had hardly opened the door when she perceived three large mayflies each of which held in its paws one of her daughters and three tall young ladies who had on their backs the three sons they all immediately passed through the window singing in chorus and very melodiously fly away fly of may fly away fly away what moved gilletta most was to see in the midst of them septimus between the blue mouse's paws they were both in a little car made of a large rose-coloured snail shell and drawn by two goldfinches with beautifully streaked feathers the mouse who now appeared to be larger than mice generally are was dressed in a beautiful gown of persian silk and a mantle of black velvet a hood tied under its chin and had two little blue horns over its forehead the car the mayflies and the young ladies went away so quickly that the queen soon lost sight of them then more concerned at the loss of septimus and her children than the fairies in their power she began to call out and weep with all her might the king hearing her grief ran to the chamber followed by his seneschal and was anxious to know what had occurred archiletta's grief was so overwhelming that she could only answer him in these words the mayflies the young ladies ah oh, sire my children are torn from me the king who only paid attention to these last words abruptly quitted gilletta and ordered carbuncle to take two muskets from his antechamber for he always had a half a dozen by him in expectation that he should one day have as many guards then crossing his royal kitchen garden he reached the country with the design of pursuing and killing the robbers about an hour after he was gone the queen who had exhausted her tears and was in the garden sighing for the loss of her children heard something humming around her and saw fall at her feet a piece of paper folded square she picked it up opened it precipitately and read as follows calm your uneasiness my dear gilletta and remember that your happiness depends on confidence and discretion you have begun well by your exactitude in giving me your cakes and cheeses and my gratitude will do the rest but always be convinced that everything comes in time to him who can wait and that you may hope everything from your friend the fairy of the fields this note together with her confidence in the power of the dairies sufficed to calm her inquietude and addressing a little linnet which she perceived on a thistle near her linnet pretty linnet said she i will do all that you wish but tell me i beg of you as soon as you hear from him some news of my little septimus at these words the linnet fluttered its wings sang a few notes and flew away and the queen persuaded that this was as much as to say i consent thanked it and made the bird a low curtsey in the meantime the king and his initial tired of the useless pursuit and had returned to the house and finding the queen very tranquil the king was somewhat offended at her apparent indifference he asked her several questions to ascertain the cause 
to which Gilletta gave no other answer than, Everything comes in time to him who can wait. This coolness so vexed him that he would have gone into a passion if his seneschal had not urged on him that Gilletta was right, and that the poet Pibrac had said so before her in one of his couplets, which he forthwith recited. King to whom Carbuncle was an oracle was silent, and listened with attention to a nice little sermon which he then preached to him on the evil of having children and the vexation and expense that they almost always entail on their parents. By my sceptre, said the king, my father-in-law is right, and those seven brats would have ruined me had they remained with me much longer. Therefore many thanks to him or her who has taken them, and as they came so are they gone. It is only so much lost time, so let us rejoice and begin again. The queen, who was afraid of saying too much, very prudently said nothing, and the king, having no more to say, returned to his closet, and played a game at piquet with his seneschal. While all this was passing with King Petard, the queen his mother, tiring of her widowhood, which had now lasted an unusually long time, resolved to remarry. With this intention she cast her eyes on a young prince of a neighbouring kingdom, sovereign of the Green Isles. He was handsome, well-made, and his mind was as pleasing as his person. His pleasures were his only employments, nothing was to be heard of but his extravagances, and it was averred that every pretty woman in his kingdom was deeply in love with him. His advantageous reputation, together with the portrait of the prince, so turned the head of the queen that she flattered herself with the idea of making him love her and fixing his inconsistency. There was only one difficulty, which was that she was neither young nor lovely. She was tall and thin, had small eyes, a long and crooked nose, and a large mouth, not entirely without a beard on the upper lip. Such a figure might not be without its advantages to a queen, as it would command respect, but it was little calculated to inspire love. It is difficult to blind one's self to one's defects when they reach a certain point. She felt, therefore, in moments of reflection, that with her person it would be impossible for her to please the young king of the Green Isles, and that to succeed in doing so she must possess beauty or at least youth. But how to come by it? How to change grey hairs and masculine features for an amiable figure, infantile graces, and an enticing mien? It is true that Gangang, -Gang, her friend, might have been of great assistance to her in this affair, but as that fairy had several times vainly urged the queen to adopt her niece, and to proclaim her heiress to the crown, she had everything to fear from exciting her cola by such a proposal. The old queen felt all this, hesitated, and struggled, but looked so frequently at the portrait of the handsome Prince of the Green Isles, that love at last conquered her fear of the fairy, to whom she communicated her sentiments conjuring her in the most pressing terms to assist her with her art and not refuse her this essential proof of her friendship she even went so far as to show her the portrait of the young prince begging her approval of her design gangang -gang could not conceal her surprise but she dissimulated her resentment she foresaw the bad consequences of protesting openly against this marriage since the king of the green isles who had nearly ruined his estates in supporting his extravagance might find it convenient to conclude the union from interested motives and might oppose her designs by the assistance of a powerful protecting genius of his kingdom so pretending to give her hand to this affair she promised the queen to set to work at making her young again but she promised herself at the same time to deceive the queen and put the execution of her will out of her majesty's power on the day that the fairy had appointed for the fulfilment of her promises, she appeared dressed in a long flesh-coloured and silver satin robe. Her headdress was composed entirely of artificial flowers and tinsel trinkets. A little dwarf held the end of her robe and carried under his left arm a black box. The queen received her with the greatest marks of respect and gratitude, and begged her, after the usual compliments, not to her happiness. The fairy consented made everybody retire, and ordered her dwarf to shut the doors and the windows. Then, having taken from her box a vellum book, ornamented with large silver clasps, a wand made of three metals, and a vial which contained a very clear but greenish liquid, she seated the queen on a cushion in the middle of the room, and desired the dwarf to place himself opposite her majesty. Then, having traced around them three spiral circles, she read in her book, 
touched the queen and the dwarf three times with her wand and sprinkled them with the liquid just spoken of then the queen's features began to grow gradually less and the size of the little dwarf to increase in proportion so that in less than three minutes they changed figures without feeling the slightest inconvenience although the queen was armed with courage still she could not witness the dwarf's increasing size without some fear which was so augmented by a bluish flame which rose all at once from the three circles that she suddenly fainted away when the fairy having finished the enchantment opened a window and disappeared with her page who notwithstanding his increased height still held his mistress's robe and carried the china box the first thing that the queen did after she had regained her senses was to consult her looking-glass she there saw with the utmost pleasure that her features were charming in the extreme but did not remark that these same features were those of a little girl of eight or nine years old that her dress had taken the shape of a girl's cap furnished with ringlets of fair hair and that her gown was changed to a frock with short sleeves and a lace apron all this added to her slender figure which the charm had not in the least degree diminished made her a very droll object however she observed it not for all the ideas that she had possessed before the enchantment those only remained which referred to the prince of the green isles and to the love which she felt for him she was therefore quite as contented with herself as her courtiers were astonished at her appearance they knew not what to do even or what part to take when the prime minister on whom all the great depended extricated them from their embarrassment that so far from contradicting the queen it was necessary to flatter her majesty's tastes and humours and he began by ordering his wife and daughters to conform themselves to her will soon to please the minister the example was followed and in a short time all the court dressed like the queen and imitated her in all she did every one even the men spoke childishly no one played at any game but puss in the corner as forfeits or birds beasts and fishes the cooks had to dress nothing but custards tartlets and little puffs nothing was done but dressing and undressing dolls and at all the games and feasts the only subject of conversation was the king of the green isles the queen spoke of him a hundred times a day and always called him her little husband she asked for him continually and was satisfied for some time with each subterfuge which was used to flatter or deceive her but at last gaiety gave way to caprice and she felt all the humours of a child who has not obtained what it wants and whose nurse dares not oppose its will after being amused for some time with so singular an event for the indolence of a court causes it to amuse itself with anything people grew tired of the puerilities of this great child and weary of the constraint as well as the complaisance which it was necessary to display they forsook her court and it was on the point of being quite abandoned when it was positively stated in the court circular that the king of the green isles who was travelling over the neighbouring kingdoms would soon arrive there at this news their courage revived the queen became so gay and cheerful that she did nothing but sing and dance while awaiting the prince's arrival the happy moment at length arrived she ran to meet him and although she was told that it was contrary to etiquette she actually determined to receive him at the foot of her staircase but as she was hastily descending she became entangled in her train which had been recently lengthened in accordance with the fashion and fell with considerable violence although her hands had saved her head and her nose was only slightly grazed she was so frightened that she uttered loud cries and was carried to her chamber when her face was bathed with hungry water and she was only quieted on being informed that her little husband was come to see her and in truth the prince appeared but the sight of the queen child made him burst into such violent fits of laughter that he was obliged to quit the room and even the palace the queen who witnessed his departure began to cry with all her might that she wanted her little husband he was followed and entreated to return but ineffectually for he would not consent but made the best of his way from a court where everybody appeared to him to be insane the queen as may be supposed was inconsolable in vain every means was tried to calm her her ill-humour only became the more insupportable in consequence and the yoke appeared to press too heavily on those who even liked her best the majority 
ashamed to be the subject of such a queen were of opinion that it would be the best to dethrone her which was about to be done when gangan who only wished to disgust her with marriage disenchanted her and restored her original appearance at the sight of her natural figure she thought of stabbing herself in despair she had found herself charming under that she had just quitted and now saw in its place but a face of upward of sixty and an ugliness which she detested she never conceived that she had even been the least ridiculous under her late metamorphosis and had certainly lost none of her love so that the loss of her youth and the prince of the green isles threw her into a languor which threatened her life and inspired her at the same time with an implacable hatred for the fairy gangan with regard to her subjects they began to pity her and to look on these events as a just punishment for the sacrifice she had made of her maternal tenderness and gratitude at the shrine of ambition and to her insensate desires it was about this time that the fairy of the fields had taken away the children of petard and giletta the generous fairy was the protectress of those who were obliged to live in the country and occupied herself incessantly in preventing or diminishing the misfortunes to which they were destined she was the better able to protect them inasmuch as she possessed the friendship and favour of titania the queen of the fairies the isle bambine which that queen had placed under her government was the place to which she had transported the four boys and the three girls of king petard and queen giletta this isle was inhabited by children only who under the protection of the fairies were well looked after by nurses and their attendants a perpetual spring reigned there the trees and meadows were always covered with fruit and flowers and the ground produced spontaneously all that could please the eye or gratify the palate the walks were charming the gardens varied and filled with pretty little carriages of all kinds drawn by spaniels with long ears but nicest and best of all the walls of the children's rooms were made of sugar-candy the floors of preserved citron and the furniture of excellent gingerbread when they were very good the children might eat of these nice things as much as they pleased without its diminishing or injuring them in the slightest degree and besides this in the streets and walks were to be seen all sorts of pretty little dolls magnificently dressed avo walked and danced for themselves the little girls who were neither proud nor greedy nor disobedient had only to form a wish and immediately sweetmeats and fruits came of themselves to seek them the dolls threw themselves into their arms and allowed themselves to be dressed and undressed caressed and punished with unparalleled docility and discretion but when on the other hand these little girls committed any fault the dolls ran away from them making faces at those who had called them the sweetmeats changed into gall and the dolls dresses became dirty and slovenly with regard to the little boys when they were neither obstinate story-telling nor idle they had little punchinellos kites rackets and playthings for every sport that can be thought of but when the nurses were discontented the punchinellos laughed at the naughty boys bouncing against their noses and upbraiding them with the faults that they had committed the kites had no wind the rackets were pierced in a word nothing succeeded with them and the more obstinate they were the worse this was there were punishments and rewards of some kind or other for all ages as for example one found himself on a donkey who had expected to be mounted on a little horse nicely caparisoned or another heard it said of herself ah how ugly she is how slovenly she is how did she come here while the good young girls were well dressed caressed and rewarded in a word nothing was neglected to correct in the children's faults both of heart and head and to instruct and arouse them they were allowed to read the annals of fairyism which contained the most remarkable histories of that empire as bluebeard the beneficent frog the good little mouse the bluebird and many others for the fairy of the fields made a great matter of it and collected them with great care from all the kingdoms of the world and it is from her copy that most of these tales are printed while the children of petard and giletta were residing in the isle of bambine every means imaginable was put in practice to overcome the obstinacy of the three boys and the pride of the three girls but these faults far from diminishing only augmented with their years for four years the particular interest which the fairy governess herself took in these children 
joined to the cares the attention and patience of the nurses had scarcely wrought the slightest perceptible change in their dispositions when feeling but too strongly that their natural tendencies were too powerful for a simple education the fairy no longer sought to overcome them by the usual means but was obliged to have recourse to the violent remedy of a metamorphosis and in truth although this extreme measure appears somewhat hard it was yet indispensable under the circumstances with a view to the formation of their future characters the children notwithstanding their changes preserved the ideas and sentiments of what they were and of what they had been still yielding to the laws of their new state when the fairy who had the power of penetrating their thoughts believed them reclaimed she restored to them their proper forms and her friendship and even procured them advantageous establishments she changed then although with considerable pain to her own feelings the three sons of petard into punchinellos and the three girls into dancing dolls and condemned them to remain as puppets for the space of three years as she was however as satisfied with prince septimus as she had been displeased with his brothers and sisters she did not wish him to be a witness of their disgrace and resolved to remove him from them the only difficulty was to find an asylum where he would be safe from the machinations of gangan so to neglect nothing on his account she thought it would be well to consult with her friend the queen of the fairies and take her mature advice on what she was about to do with this intention she put on her green velvet farthingale her jonquil coloured satin mantle and her little blue riding hood with nine white mayflies attached to her gilded wicker post-chaise their harness being of rose-coloured ribbon she set out with all diligence and arrived in a short time at the fortunate island where the queen of the fairies ordinarily resided having alighted at the end of a magnificent avenue of orange and citron trees she entered the courtyard of the castle where she found in a row twenty-four black genii six feet high wearing long gowns with trains and carrying on the left shoulder a polished steel club they had behind them seventy-four black ostriches spotted with red and blue which they held in leashes keeping a profound silence these black genii were wicked fairies condemned to hold these posts as slaves for several ages according to the nature of their crimes when they perceived the fairy they saluted her grounding their clubs on the pavement and as that was of steel also it made a clashing sound and emitted sparks of fire this honour was rendered to all who like the fairy of the fields had a government having ascended the staircase which was made of porphyry jasper agate and lapis lazuli she saw in the first apartment twelve young ladies simply dressed without hoods they had only a key-chain around their waist and the half-wand with which they saluted her as they had done the slaves the fairy returned their salutation for their employment was such as is generally given to those who are about to be initiated in the art of fairyism she passed through a long suite of apartments magnificently furnished and at last reached the queen's antechamber which she found full of fairies who were met there from all parts of the world some on business others to pay their court to her majesty the queen's closet was nearly empty when she saw the old fairy gangan come from it the respect which fairies and all good people ever pay to their sovereign could scarcely prevent her from laughing at the sight of so grotesque a figure as that of gangan over a skirt of green satin bedizened with blue and gold lace she wore a large farthingale of the same material embroidered with rose-coloured caterpillars and a half girdle enriched with emeralds hanging to a silver chain she had a small looking-glass and a patch-box a large watch and a casket of rare coins her ears were loaded with two large pearl and ruby drops and she had on her head a light yellow velvet hood with an aigrette of amethysts and topazes a large bouquet of jasmine ornamented the front of her person and ten or twelve patches scattered over a faded rouge covered a wrinkled and dry rose-leaf coloured skin if the fairy of the fields was surprised at the ridiculous equipage of gangan the latter was not less so at meeting with her rival at the moment when she least expected it she was not ignorant of the protection afforded by the fairy to the children of petard and Gilletta. but as the place they were then in prevented her giving vent to her resentment she concealed it as well as she could 
and affecting an air of politeness mingled with dignity said to her what madam have you resolved to leave the quiet of the country to revel in the tumult of a court you must have had weighty reasons to induce you to make such a sacrifice the reasons which bring you and myself here are certainly widely different interrupted the fairy of the fields and as neither interest nor ambition have ever been motives for the grant of my protection and as i only yield it to the worthy and grateful i believe so replied gangan turkeys and geese are a very good sort of people true answered the fairy of the fields warmly much more so than gorgons for they are not unjust what do you say to that the dispute would not have ended here if the fairy of the fields had not been warned that the queen was alone and wished to speak with her so the two fairies saluted and parted as women who perfectly hate each other and always do titania who perceived the emotion that this dispute had raised in her friend feigned ignorance of its cause but requested to be informed on the subject the fairy of the fields pleased to gratify her mistress's curiosity did not hesitate in revealing the unjust motives of gangan for persecuting king petard and queen Gilletta, and informed her that pity had made her endeavour to thwart the perfidious designs of that fairy your intentions are praiseworthy said the queen to her and i am glad to see in you this generous zeal in protecting the unfortunate but i am afraid notwithstanding that gangan will still manage to avenge herself for the kindness you have shown to the good Gilletta and her children she is wicked and i often receive complaints in respect to her but be assured that if she again abuse her power to your injury i will punish her in a terrible and exemplary manner i can say no more the council hour has arrived but at my return we will confer together on the means of thwarting your enemy's wicked designs the queen then left the apartment when the fairy of the fields was alone she could not resist an inclination to consult her sovereign's books all the mysteries of fairyism are therein revealed and by them may be discovered from day to day what is passing all over the universe the queen only had the power of suspending or turning the course of events holding over fairies the same dominion as the fairies hold over mankind protectress of our hero had no sooner opened these books than she read in them distinctly that by the power of grand fairyism the perfidious gangan was at that moment carrying off the young prince septimus and was then transporting him to the inaccessible island in which she had kept her own niece since the hour of her birth at the sight she first trembled for the life of her protege and then for his heart and his sentiments for she knew that this wicked fairy was more capable of corrupting than of forming the mind the uneasiness that this event caused her gave way to reflection and she was considering the means of preventing the consequences of this occurrence when the queen came from council and rejoined her from the sorrow which she perceived on her friend's countenance titania guessed what had taken place during her absence and speaking to her said you have i see satisfied your curiosity and have learned that which i would have kept from your knowledge i was unable it is true to refuse gangan the power of grand fairyism since according to our laws it is due to her long standing but the knowledge which i possess of her character has made me limit this power to a certain space of time be assured generous fairy that when that period has elapsed your enemy shall be severely punished if she shall have abused the power which she holds only from our laws and my kindness however to give you to-day a proof of my friendship for you and to place Gilletta's other children in whom you are interested out of gangan's reach take this vial and rub them with the liquid it contains it is invisible water and conceals objects from the sight of fairies alone it is a charm such as gangan with all her power cannot overcome it go my dear friend remember always that your queen loves generosity and protects virtue and ever rely on her protection and tenderness at these words the fairy respectfully took the queen's hand kissed it and departed no sooner was she in her island than she made use of the invisible water with it she rubbed the three punchinellos and the three dancing dolls with the exception of the tips of their noses which she left visible in order to recognize them herself then having given her orders and consulted her books she set out for petard's kingdom where she learned that her presence was necessary in truth when she arrived there petard's little state was in sad disorder and the cause was this 
it was now a long time past since the house in which his majesty had resided and in which his father-in-law the seneschal had lived before him had fallen in on all sides in spite of the repairs which it had undergone petard had resolved in a consultation with a master mason whom he had made his chief architect to rebuild this crown officer not having for some time done anything for their majesties had completely raised the old building with a design of commencing a new one which according to his account was to be much more magnificent the king's savings since the abduction of his children and his annual revenues not however being sufficient for the erection of this new edifice he resolved at the recommendation of his chamberlain and solicitor-general to levy a tax in order to raise the funds necessary to meet the expense of his new palace his subjects who had not hitherto paid taxes murmured loudly and swore not to do so then they even threatened to complain of him to the queen mother to their discontent which as usual was not very civilly expressed were joined the remonstrances of carbuncle who insisted that it was ridiculous to make others pay for a thing which could neither be useful nor profitable to them that his majesty was in truth but a man like other men that having his own property and revenues he ought not to take those of others for the sake of having more to spend that consequently while he had only the means of building a house he ought not to have a castle and that he who had only a crown ought to spend a crown only all these reasons appeared to be very good to the king but at the same time the solicitor-general and the chamberlain told him that he was master and it was not worth while having subjects if they were not made to pay for the trouble that was taken in their government that they were made to work and kings to spend and that there was but one seneschal capable of thinking or advising otherwise the king thought that they had also reasoned very justly and determined consequently to levy the tax however each of the councillors took his own side of the question and loudly proclaimed his decision they shall not pay said one party they shall be made to pay said the other it shall not be so said carbuncle i am determined it shall said the solicitor-general or i will lose my latin at last they made such a hubbub that it would have been impossible to hear oneself speak the king who no longer understood what they said and knew not what part to take left them and when he was with the queen said to her oh by my sceptre if this continues i will give up governing and then whoever wishes to be king may and i will go so far so far i will not here speak of the kingdom the people nor the palace do not irritate yourself sire said the queen to him quietly i have already had the honour of telling your majesty that everything comes in time to him who can wait but said the king what do you wish me to wait for if they who have taken away our children had left us a house instead of them we should not have been so badly off but doubtless gangan has done it all and if this continues we shall have no more houses than we have children then he commenced repeating so many tiresome invectives against the fairies that the good Giletta was much vexed with him the fairy who had witnessed for some time what was passing and was very anxious for the queen's peace of mind at last appeared to her in the shape of a linnet as she had done before and quieted her with the assurance that she would soon give convincing proofs of her friendship and protection Giletta, transported with joy kissed her a thousand times having first asked her permission entreated her to stop and promised her as an inducement that every day while she resided with her she should have a little cake made of millet flour hemp seed and milk the fairy agreed and Giletta's promises were duly fulfilled a fortnight after her arrival the king who generally rose early was very much surprised to find himself in quite a new house very convenient and strongly built i say a house for it was but a house and not at all a palace there was about it neither architecture painting sculpture nor gilding on the ground floor was a kitchen a pantry a dining-room and an audience chamber on the first floor an antechamber a bedroom a closet the queen's wardrobe and a large closet in the wing for the king in which his library of which mention has been made was already arranged above were nice galleries well sealed from which was visible the most beautiful prospect in the world a dairy had not been forgotten with all the utensils thereunto appertaining but the most admirable part of the whole affair was that the house was well furnished and stored with everything necessary the furniture was exactly like both in materials and shape to that of their majesties and they could hardly have told it apart 
if the one had not been newer than the other. Petard's astonishment may easily be imagined at finding himself in a strange house, but it was considerably increased when on looking through one of his bedroom windows he saw where had been his little royal kitchen garden a large grass plot and bowling green at the end of which was a pretty pond and a forest of lofty trees to the right of the bowling green was a kitchen garden stocked with different vegetables and to the left an orchard planted with all kinds of fruit trees he considered all this for some time but his surprise giving way to joy he ran to the queen who was in bed and still asleep and waking her cried my dear my dear pray get up and look at our new house and fine gardens do you know the meaning of it all i have not the least idea the queen hardly gave herself time to put on her petticoat morning gown and slippers before she ran to the window with the king who immediately conducted her all round the apartments and thence to the ground floor where they found the kitchen and pantry furnished with everything that was necessary all these marvels only made good king petard afraid but the queen who guessed whence it had all come had not the same feeling but dared not to say anything about it they were in the state when the seneschal who had been looking for them for an hour in the king's house entered this more in the way of the duty of his situation than in the hope of finding their majesties there he too knew not what to think of a house built in a single night and although he was less fearful than his son-in-law he only began to take courage when he found himself in company with them the king for his part was glad enough to see him come in and each taking an arm of the queen they went over the house a second time from top to bottom and all over the gardens everybody argued a good deal on the singularity of this occurrence some were of the opinion that their majesties were very bold to reside in a house built by fairies and so run the risk of being tormented by them others on the contrary held that they did quite right and that it was to be wished that all the old houses in the kingdom were rebuilt in a similar manner as one is easily reconciled to comfort and to novelties after having talked a good deal no more was said about it and the king gradually grew as accustomed to his new house as though he had lived in it all his life thus the question of the tax was no longer discussed quietness returned to the kingdom of petard and union once more existed between the high crown officers the poor architect alone had half a mind to hang himself but was at last contented with wishing all genie and fairies at the bottom of the sea for interfering with his employment calling them a hundred times magicians and sorcerers while the fairy of the fields was bringing about all these wonders she observed in Gilletta so much respect for the fairies and so much gratitude to her that feeling herself more and more interested in that queen's welfare she could not refuse to make a longer stay at her court than she had originally intended she reassured the queen also of her children's fate and explained to her their punishment and her reasons for proceeding to this extremity but as true and tender friendship knows how to disguise the most interesting things when a knowledge of them would afflict the person loved she carefully concealed from her the abduction of her dear septimus and the anxiety she felt for him herself then having recommended to her confidence patience and discretion if she wished to attain happiness she quitted her with regret to return to her government of the isle of bambine on her arrival there she was immediately informed of an event of a nature unheard of since the establishment of the island the senior nurse who during the fairy's absence had performed the duties of governess stated to her that some obstinate and unruly children who had been forgiven upon several occasions assisted by their friends the dolls had revolted and had expressed their determination of no longer obeying their nurses and that the spirit of rebellion had grown to such an extent in a short time that its course had been with much difficulty arrested that she had therefore been compelled to exert all her authority and had begun by imprisoning the dolls in boxes and that as to the children she had condemned some to having nothing but dry bread to eat for a fortnight others to wear their nightcaps in the daytime for a month and some even to be imprisoned between four chairs for two hours on each day until they had publicly asked for pardon the fairy highly approved of the senior nurse's conduct and praised her very much for her zeal but as an example was necessary for the maintenance of order she condemned the most mutinous of the rebels to a transformation of a hundred years as punches judies and dancing dolls sending them into different parts of the world to work for their livelihood as puppets and thus to minister to the amusement all good little girls and boys and to serve as sights for the people 
she proceeded to this extremity with the less regret as she was informed that her six favourites had taken but a small part in the rebellion charmed with the alteration which thus began to appear in them she made them come before her and speaking to the tips of their noses for she could see no more of them she reprimanded them in terms rather mild and severe and dismissed them with a promise of her friendship and rewards if she should in the sequel have found reason to be satisfied with their conduct though this event and her duty did not allow her absence from a place where indeed her presence seemed so necessary yet she could not long contain her feelings on behalf of little septimus and her impatience to hear news of him so soon therefore as she thought her little people could go on tolerably well without her she departed with the hope of satisfying her curiosity and of gratifying her fondness for the young prince that she might not be perceived by the genie and the fairies who are continually traversing the middle region of the air she took to her little post-chaise which she carefully closed on all sides providing herself with her wand and other articles of fairyism above all not forgetting the invisible water then having ordered her six flying lizards to use great speed she arrived in a few minutes at a short distance from the inaccessible island she alighted dismissed her chaise and rubbing herself over with the water just named she overcame without being seen obstacles which but for this liquid would have successfully opposed her entrance gangan had in order to prevent genie and fairies from entering her island surrounded it with a treble enclosure formed by a rapid torrent the waters of which rolled over rocks which they had split with their violence tearing up trunks of trees and dashing the fragments in the waves the shores of this isle were defended by twenty-four dragons of enormous size and the flames which they vomited at the sight of fairies or genie reached to the clouds and uniting formed an impenetrable wall of fire the fairy of the fields had hardly been seeking for intelligence as to the fate of septimus above an hour when chance afforded her the most favourable opportunity in the world she saw coming toward her gangan accompanied by a dive for she was only served by evil genie and her countenance appeared inflamed with passion and she spoke very vehemently profiting by her invisibility the fairy of the fields resolved to listen when she heard gangan speak to her companion nearly as follows yes my dear barbarek you see me in despair i am about to lose for ever the largest kingdom of the universe the ungrateful mother of petard has died without even a desire to be reconciled with me nor is that all she has bound her subject by an oath not only never to receive at my hands the successor to her crown but even to restore the throne to her son or to one of her grandsons i tried to win the people by my kindness but found everywhere an inveterate hatred against me they refused my gifts which they looked on as equally perfidious and treasonable and they have decided by a unanimous and formal resolution on following the queen's direction by depriving me of a throne on which i had reckoned to place my niece it shall not however be long ere these ungrateful people feel the effects of my just anger and to begin with the principal causes of my disgrace take from my stables one of my largest griffins fly to the isle of bambin seize the brothers and sisters of septimus and bring them here i myself will undertake to carry off petard and gilletta and when they are brought together i will transform the king and his queen into rabbits and their children into terriers if a spark of pity which i yet feel for septimus should abandon me i will not answer that he also do not feel the effects of my vengeance hasten however to prepare everything for the execution of my plans and let us remember my dear barbarek that having abandoned the laws of the paris for those of the divas we are become the enemies of fairies and of mankind and that we must neglect nothing to overwhelm them all with the weight of our hatred the fairy of the fields could not hear this discourse without shuddering she remained for some time motionless but recalling her senses and feeling of what consequence it was not to stay any longer in this terrible abode she hastened to implore the powerful assistance of the queen of the fairies she immediately left the island which she had scarcely done when the sky became obscured the earth trembled and dreadful groanings accompanied with thunder and lightning seemed to announce the speedy destruction of the universe shortly afterward the air was restored to calmness but the day growing still darker and darker a new spectacle as terrible as the preceding succeeded 
the twenty-four dragons who guarded the approaches to the isle, making frightful howlings, lanced against each other streams of flame, and strove in fiery combat, which concluded by consuming them all. Day again reappeared, and where the torrent and the island had been, nothing was to be seen but a dry and arid rock, while from its summit there flew a black ostrich carrying on its back Prince Septimus and the little Princess Gangan's niece. These prodigies had not so much overcome the fairy of the fields, but that moved with the situation of these amiable children, and her kindness inclining her to follow them, she immediately set out, with so much diligence that in a short time she overtook the black ostrich. Her first impulse was to take it from the prince and the princess, but observing that the bird was directing its flight towards the fortunate island, she contented herself with following and watching it at a short distance. Indeed, in a short time the ostrich alighted on that island, and directed its steps towards the queen of the fairies herself. The sovereign was seated at the entrance of her palace on a golden throne enriched with jewels, surrounded by her twelve fairies, the twenty-four black genie who had been before mentioned, and by a numerous court. The moment the ostrich approached the throne, the fairy of the field seized the prince and princess and placed them at the queen's feet. When Gangan resumed her original shape and proper character, confusion, malice, and despair were depicted by turns on her countenance, and she was in the most cruel suspense as to what was about to happen. When the queen spoke to her in these words, The malignity of your mind and the perversity of your heart have, I see, prevented your making a good use of that power which I bestowed upon you. Very far from repairing your first faults by the gift of grand fairyism, which the laws and my kindness vouchsafed to you, you have on the contrary abused that, and as this abuse now calls for my justice upon you, receive at once the punishment due to your misdeeds. You will lose for two years all power as a fairy, and assuming during that period the shape of a stork, you shall be the slave of my humblest genie. With these words the queen touched her with her sceptre, and all the fairies having held over her their wands, into ten of approbation, they pronounced certain words, during which the unfortunate Gangan became a stork, and immediately went to join the other animals of the species. The queen then summoned the fairy judicious, and confided the young prince and the princess to her care, while they should remain at her court particularly advising her to form their hearts by cultivating their minds. She embraced Septimus and Feliciana, which was the princess's name, and these amiable children, penetrated with joy and gratitude, quitted her arms with sorrow for those of their guardian judicious. They profited so well by their education during the two years they resided with the queen of the fairies, that they obtained the love and admiration of all her court. When the one had reached the age of fourteen, and the other of twelve years, the queen of the fairies resolved to unite them in marriage, and to restore them, with the brothers and sisters of Septimus, to King Petard and his queen Giletta. But at the same time, she informed the fairy of the fields that as an example to Septimus and Feliciana, she had resolved that the rebellious children, although now perfectly cured of their faults, should only resume their proper shapes in the presence of the newly married couple, and when they should have arrived at the king, their father's palace. Then, having determined the time of their departure, she confided to the fairy of the fields the six children of whom she had been so careful, and having ordered her to choose for them husbands and wives, she summoned the fairy judicious and charged her to accompany the prince Septimus and his princess. These amiable children shed tears on quitting her, to whom they owed all their happiness, and the generous queen, embracing them tenderly, promised them her friendship and saw them depart with much sorrow. They lost no time in repairing to the court of Petard, where that king had been for some days extremely embarrassed. His mother, the queen, after languishing for many years, had at last vacated the throne, and deputies had been dispatched from her kingdom, inviting her son to accept the crown. They had already asked for an audience, and Petard was greatly puzzled as to the manner in which it should be granted. He was uncertain whether he ought to receive them standing or seated, on horseback or on foot, and to debate this point the council was assembled, where everybody decided as usual, the seneschal carbuncle, maintained that the king ought to be standing, asserting that he had heard that the emperor Charlemagne and the twelve peers of France were always standing, and that they never seated themselves except to eat and to sleep. The solicitor-general opined that his majesty should be seated, 
because kings and judges ought always to be at their ease, and that except a bed there was nothing so convenient as an armchair. The chamberlain, on the contrary, was of the opinion that the king should appear on horseback, alleging that that was the most noble attitude for kings, inasmuch as their statues always thus represented them. Each of the councillors maintained, as usual, his own opinions. They shouted, they quarrelled, and would perhaps even have gone further, if the king, raising his voice above theirs, had not said, "'Do you intend to leave off? There is surely noise enough about a chair, more or less. As I shall meet them, so they shall see me, and as they find me, so they must take me. That is all I know about the matter. But as to becoming their king, many thanks to them. I should go mad with all the cares of royalty, which they tell me I should have on my mind. So long flourish my little kingdom. Since I am well off with that, I will hold fast to it. And they must accommodate themselves as well as they can. However, as they wish to have an audience, an audience they must have. So let them be summoned. The councillors then retired, each murmuring that the king had not taken his advice, and blaming him for always doing as he thought proper for himself. While they went to fetch the deputies to the presence, his majesty, thinking himself wiser than his council, put on his royal clothes, and seated himself at the foot of his bed, of which he had had the curtains arranged in festoons around the posts. He held in one hand his sceptre, in the other his cap and fringed gloves. The queen was at his right hand on a chair, covered with blue serge and ornamented with large gilt nails, with her women behind her. On the left of the king were his high officers, who were nearly all laughing in their sleeves at the singular figure of their king. When all was arranged, the door was opened, and the deputies entered, followed by all the people of King Petard's little state. They made him three deep salams, which the king and queen acknowledged by three others as profound, and were about to commence their harangue when a woman of majestic figure entered, leading a young man about fourteen or fifteen years of age, and addressing herself to Giletta thus spoke. Queen, everything comes in time to him who can wait. Your misfortunes are over, and your destiny has changed its course. Behold the prince your son, whom a superior power has protected from the effects of Gangan's wickedness. The perfidious fairy can no longer annoy him. Her malice has just been confounded. Receive at last your dear son Septimus, and you, deputies, render homage to the lawful successor to the throne of your kingdom. The king acknowledging his son, took him in his arms, and kissed him a thousand times, then hastening to the fairy he embraced her without paying any regard to her age or character. He did the same with Carbuncle, the solicitor-general, the chamberlain, and all who were around him. Then taking off his royal mantle, he put it upon Septimus, gave him his scepter, seated him at the foot of the bed, and began to shout with all his might, "'Long live the king!' which was immediately repeated by the nobles, and taken up by all the people to whom the king kept crying out, "'Shout away! You there, shout away!' Meanwhile the queen, penetrated with joy and gratitude, had fallen at the fairy's feet, embracing her and weeping, when the fairy, having raised her, signified that she wished to speak. Everybody was immediately silent, excepting the king, whose joy was so great that he neither saw nor heard anything until at last, finding himself out of breath, he was also quieted, and the fairy spoke. "'What you see,' said she, "'is only a portion of the favours which your friend, the fairy of the fields, bestows upon you. She gives you with the prince, a young and amiable princess, whom the queen of the fairies has destined to be the wife of your king. If the qualities of her mind and the beauty of her person are some slight guarantee for the happiness of this favoured couple, the mildness of your character and the goodness of a heart, which I have taken pains to form, may assure to you its duration. Confirm, then, this happy union, and thus deserve the fairy of the fields powerful protection, as well as that of. The king would hear no more, but taking the hands of the prince and princess. Done, cried he, I marry them with all my heart, and give to them all my kingdoms and my revenues. As to my other children, I shall trouble myself no more about them. Our friend, this good lady of the fields, will not allow them to want for anything. So let us have the wedding, and rejoice. You shall all dine with me, though. By the by, I do not know that I shall have too much to give you, but as my wife says, 
everything comes to him who can wait now father-in-law he continued turning to carbuncle go to the kitchen have all killed that is in my poultry yard and above all let us have good cheer for i would have this affair well spoken of the seneschal obeyed but as he was crossing the dining-room he perceived a table laid with twenty-four dishes of the best meats he went no further but quickly returned to relate to the king and queen what he had just seen everybody anxious to behold this fairy festival went immediately to the dining-room not however without some fear and consequently without much ceremony the sight surprised them greatly at first they hesitated at tasting the food but after a while taking heart began to think it looked very nice and the king to whom all this cost nothing set them the example by eating with all his heart and drinking bumpers every time the bottle came around to him it is said he was not sparing of his old stories and lons mots but that although the good man often repeated them and always in the same terms they were always followed by shouts of laughter when they had been at the table about two hours violins were heard in the audience chamber and as they had all eaten and drunk enough they willingly rose from the table the king in high good humour wished for nothing better than a dance and insisted on opening the ball with the young queen calling for his favourite dance which resembled sir roger de paris the violin struck up he began but after putting them out and telling them they did not know the figure he gave up in despair and asked the young prince and princess to dance a minuet which they did with admirable grace they were just performing the last obeisance when six puppets entered the room finely dressed three as roman knights and three as roman ladies each of these six puppets had by its side the visible tip of a nose and the whole entree was conducted by a lady who was however taken little notice of so much attention to the spectacle of the puppets attract they all made room to receive them and the puppets immediately performed a pas de deux in which the six tips of the noses figured admirably the ballet over they arranged themselves in a ring in the same order they had observed on entering their conductress placed herself in the centre touched the six tips of the noses with the end of her wand and immediately there appeared in their places three punchinellos and three dancing dolls very good very good said the king all that will do for my grandchildren and provided they cost me nothing to keep and close i will take care of them with pleasure till the grandchildren come not so fast sire replied the lady have patience everything comes in time to him who can wait immediately the twelve puppets began to dance again and the spectators were in the highest degree astonished to see them change perceptibly and gradually take another face and new dress mercy on us cried the king why there are harry dick and george my dear why surely there are josephine clementina and arabella love no really i cannot believe it oh by my sceptre but this is admirable then speaking to the conductress hold he said to her i will bet my cap and royal mantle that you are our friend the lady of the fields if faith you are worth your weight in gold and here are our children all ready shod and clad and as big as their father and mother but how are we to get them married i will manage that replied the fairy of the fields for it was herself and it shall be done immediately at these words the king beside himself with joy took her hand paid her i know not how many compliments after his fashion and seated her near Gilletta, to whom he cried this is the lady of the fields and our very good friend the queen overcome by her feelings gave herself up completely to all her gratitude to the fairy and all her tenderness to her children the fairy then introduced to Gilletta the unknown princes and princesses who were with her and proposed them in marriage with her six children the king and queen consented immediately all who were present applauded the fairy's choice and the deputies proclaimed septimus and feliciana king and queen the seven marriages were celebrated in a manner worthy of the wisdom of the fairy judicious and the noble simplicity of the fairy of the fields septimus gave to each of his brothers and brothers-in-law the government of the largest and most wealthy provinces of his kingdom and the seven princes set out with their wives and accompanied by the fairies who only quitted each on his arrival at their several capitals they there gave them instructions for the government of their families and provinces and after loading them with marks of kindness and generosity returned each to her own duties 
As for Petard and Gilletta, their children's fortune made them neither ambitious nor jealous, nor did it change their ways of thinking. The pomp and majesty of a grand queen did not agree with Gilletta's simplicity, while Petard's character and genius were not suited to the cares of a large kingdom, and they would not have exchanged the one his seneschal, his game at piquet, and his kitchen garden, the other her spinning wheel, her dairy, and the friendship of the fairy of the fields, for all the grandeur of the world. End of chapter 18